Hello and welcome back to the workshop. One day I decided I wanted to build a 1997 PC. So that's exactly what I did here. It just looks like your average beige box. Uh, a little bit yellowed. I don't really care about that kind of stuff. It's there to play video games, not to look good. So I wanted to experience what it would have been like to go in and buy a 1997 PC without the benefit of hindsight. So I'm not going to do the usual boring stuff of just putting in there a Voodoo 1 and then calling it a day like, woo, the Voodoo magic, woo. No, I wanted to do something a little less boring. So we're actually going to check out a different graphics chip from a different manufacturer that's still around today. I thought this would be a really interesting little time capsule machine. Not every single part is going to be authentic 1997. Some of them might be a bit newer, but the main parts are, are from 1997. Also, I posed another challenge for myself. I didn't really want to spend money on this because, I mean, especially 1997 vintage prices can be pretty pricey. I mean, if you just think about it, another reason why I didn't put a Voodoo in there is because I don't feel like paying, you know, like 100, 200 uh, US dollars to uh, just for a crappy video card. So I decided to just build every build this whole PC with parts I already own. So I've owned everything already. So. I would say, you know, they just kind of accumulated from different bundles and just, you know, found it here and there, whatever. Overall, this PC must have cost me around, uh, I don't know, 15 to 20 US dollars maybe at most. I used to have a 1997, 1998 CD drive in there, but that didn't really read discs all that well, even after I cleaned it, so, yeah. Had to go with something a little bit more reliable and something horrible, 52X, I hate this, it's so loud. But it is what it is. And uh, I ran out of uh, these brackets. So the hard drive is a little bit, you know, showing. But I think that's actually kind of a cool look to it in a weird way. So this is a normal uh, baby AT case tower, not ATX. And that probably already sort of tells you what might be inside. At first, I wanted to go with a. Pentium 2 machine because that came out in 1997 and it would have been cool to experience because I never had a Pentium 2 machine but at the same time the early Pentium 2s came out in 1997 and the better ones only came out in 1998 and I, I wanted it to be a 97 machine so I stuck with a slightly older platform so yeah let's uh, rotate the case around I don't have the uh, the panel screwed on right now it's just uh, the usual stuff so, in the back, we have the power supply, which is actually, it came with this case, because that sticker is hanging over to the, uh, to the case itself. We've got an uh, AT keyboard connector, PS2 mouse, parallel port, we've got a video card with a VGA output, one VGA output, so definitely not um, voodoo. We have some USB that I wanted to get working, but I'll talk about that later. I had a little bit of a workaround as to how to how I got that working. No network card. I could, I guess, install a network card to like copy stuff over, but I don't really have a network set up currently to to just copy uh, copy files over. We have here a sound card, you know, game port, and all the all the jacks. We'll take a look at uh, the inside of it in a little bit to see what's what, and some more ports on the bottom. So. I'm going to take you over to the inside of the computer. Ta-da! It's glorious cable management. Absolutely impeccable. So here we are, the inside of the PC. There's the average 200 watt power supply, I believe. Nothing special. It is AT, even though the motherboard does support uh, ATX right next to it. But we're not using that. The motherboard is a Gigabyte GA5AA Socket 7 motherboard. That probably already tells you what's inside. And no, it's not actually an AMD machine. This is an Intel MMX. And it's the fastest desktop variant of the MMX. The 233 megahertz. And I have actually done a bit of overclocking. Because uh, stock, these are only... 66 megahertz FSB, I believe. And I went way above that. And I think, I'll talk about this later, but I think this machine with this Pentium MMX is 
about as fast as uh, some of the early Pentium 2s because it did a pretty good job with the overclocking. Thankfully, I got lucky with that. We have a 20 gigabyte hard drive. It's a uh, Seagate, I believe. And we have a compact flash card adapter in here in the primary IDA channel. Right over there, we have a 256 megabyte uh, compact flash card that contains Windows 95, but we'll get to the software side a bit later. There's our Alley chipset. We have 128 megabytes of SD RAM, SDR, SD RAM, and here's our graphics chip. This is an ATI Rage Pro Turbo AGP, 8 megabyte video card. And this will allow us to check out one of the competing APIs from ATI, the ATI CIF. Some games have supported that, so we're going to definitely take a look at some of those games. And on the bottom we have a Sound Blaster 16. I actually found this card in a recycling center for two US dollars or something like that. We just have a normal Socket 7 cooler. This is what it came with, this PC. Originally it had an AMD K62500 in it, but it just wasn't really working out too well for me. Especially when I tried to pair it with a stronger video card, because this is one of the earliest AGP motherboards, and the AGP slot isn't really great. It doesn't really support a lot of power throughput, so I was getting a lot of issues with a ton of games just crashing and stuff like that if I tried to put in a better video card. So I think this is about the maximum that this motherboard will safely support. We also have a nice and big PC speaker over there. So overall, I think this is a pretty decent machine. It is mostly 1997 parts. The motherboard is, the video card is definitely... Uh, I think the sound card has a 1986 date on it. CPU came out in 97. So, yeah, let's take a look at the overclock and the software side, and then uh, we'll take it over from there. So after launching the machine, we can see the power on self-test. And the CPU is identifying as a Pentium MMX 280 megahertz, which is due to our overclock, but it's not the actual correct speed. It doesn't display that. The real speed is actually 275 megahertz with my overclocking settings, which I'm actually pretty happy about. But it took me quite a while to get to this point. And the reason is because I had to go look online to find documentation for my motherboard and find what dip switches and jumpers do what feature. However, the problem is that this motherboard has three or four different revisions that all have different functionality when it comes to the dip switches and the jumpers. So after unsuccessfully trying to use two different PDF files with different jumper settings, I ended up finding a third one on the Gigabyte website, which was the correct one for my version of the motherboard, so I was able to overclock the CPU. Now these Pentium MX CPUs have a 66 MHz bus speed, which is actually equal to the Pentium 2's 66 MHz bus speed as well. However, with the Pentium 2, the L2 cache is actually located on the CPU, and it's running at half the CPU speed. So for a Pentium 2 233 MHz CPU, the cache is running at around 112 MHz. I knew that the Pentium 2s are definitely faster than this Pentium MX, and that is why I decided to overclock this CPU to try and compete with the at least the lower end of the Pentium 2s, and I think I succeeded. While the Pentium MX doesn't have onboard L2 cache, it is supplied by the motherboard, and the access to it is 66 MHz, which is the bus speed. However, when I overclocked this CPU, I decided to not just up the multiplier, but instead I decided to down the multiplier and up the bus speed. This way I'm increasing the communication speed on the motherboard uh, between the CPU and the L2 cache as well. And while I was aiming at 300 megahertz, it was unstable at no matter what voltages, and I decided to just step it back a little bit. So I ended up with 275 megahertz instead of 233. The way I achieved it is I actually went down to 2.5x with the multiplier, which gave us 250 megahertz at 100 megahertz bus speed, which was already pretty decent. But I was able to up the bus speed a bit more to 110 megahertz, which gave us 275 megahertz and 110 megahertz bus speed. What that means is the L2 cache is basically accessed at almost the same speed as the L2 cache for a 233 megahertz Pentium 2. So in a way, this actually, I think, competes with the early Pentium 2s really well, and I'm pretty happy about that. 
this would have been definitely a really good budget option back then to try and get the maximum out of your system and compete with the new Pentium 2s. This motherboard also comes with 512 kilobytes of L2 cache, so it's equal amount to what you'd get with a Pentium 2. While 128 megabytes of system memory might sound a little bit too much for 1997, this machine has three different slots, so I think it would have been perfectly feasible to have 128 megabytes of RAM. And so here we go, Windows 95 loading from our compact flash card. The main reason I did it this way is so that I can modify the operating system without having to nuke everything from the hard drive which contains the games. This is my first time using Windows 95. I never had it. Even my first computer just sort of skipped Windows 95 because uh, it used to have Windows 3.1 and then we switched over to Windows 98. My only memory of Windows 95 really is in a computer class and at a friend's house who had a Windows 95 machine and it always just <laughs> at the time seemed a bit more limited than Windows 98, which it sort of is, but in a way it works better with some stuff. So I'm excited to check it out. So without further ado, let's check out some 1997 video games. I have an assortment of 97 or older video games to showcase in this video. We might check out some newer games in future videos. All of this gameplay has been recorded live on my stream and I'm just editing it into my video. First up we have Grand Theft Auto. This game was revolutionary. I really loved it. Back in the day, still love it. I think it's an awesome game. 1997 is the release date and there's something weird about this game. I think a lot of people don't know this game the way I do and they don't appreciate it the way I do. This is what I think of when I think of GTA 1. The low color mode. The game came with two different color modes, low color and high color, and I always felt like the high color mode just didn't look quite right. The colors were all a little bit weird. Purple road and yellow sidewalk, whereas here in the low color mode I think everything just looks right. It looks actually more colorful to me than the, the high color mode and I really enjoy playing this version of the game and I would always want to just play this version of the game because this is how I know it and I think it looks better. You cannot change the resolution, it's stuck at 320 by 200 but I think it still looks great. And here's the high color mode in comparison. You can just kind of see how it, I, I, it looks weird. But of course it runs perfectly fine on the machine, so. Throughout these tests I'm not really going to use benchmarks and uh, frame rate analysis programs because it's beside the point. I just wanted to create this machine as a 1997 experience and just to see what it would be like to own this machine in 97 and play all the games that you can. So I'm just going to go by feel and sort of just tell you what the game feels like on the machine. Here we have Virtua Cop 2. I also played this quite a bit back in the day. Seems to be running really well on this machine. No issues whatsoever. Shoot. 
Next, let's check out GL quick, running in OpenGL. Our ATA Rage Pro Turbo video card is actually doing pretty well in this game. The graphics are really nice and it runs well. But let's run the time demo. Looks like we've got 24.5 FPS. Next up we have Need for Speed 2 Second Edition. This is the first game here where we're in a bit of a disadvantage going with ATI as opposed to with a 3DFX card as NFS2 really only supports 3DFX Glide and has no support for Direct 3D or OpenGL so we're going to have to run the software under our mode. However it's still pretty decent as it is although obviously it doesn't look as good as a 3DFX mode. Let's check out another racing game, this time a rally game. This one is one of my favorites from back in the day. International Rally Championship, also known as IRC. I believe this uses Direct3D. and it seemed to be running pretty nice on this machine. A couple slowdowns here and there, but nothing too major. Right. 
Now let's take a look at the first game in our list that actually uses the unique functionalities of our video card, namely the ATICIF API. Tomb Raider 1 has had patches for various different video cards and you could also play in software renderer mode but there was no Direct 3D or OpenGL as those weren't really around yet. Here we have the ATI CIF version, Tomb ATI, and honestly I think this looks better than the 3DFX version. The textures look much more sharp than what you'd see in the 3DFX version. Frame rate is decent, doesn't really dip below 30 very often. Overall a very playable version and I kind of wish that this is how I have actually played through Terminator 1 instead of the PS1 version because it just not only looks much better but you can also save everywhere in the PC version so that's nice. Another game that takes advantage of the benefits of the ATI CIF API, Croc. You can, you have to have the 1.0 version of the game because for some reason later versions have removed a bunch of the APIs such as Matrox Mystique and S3D and ATI CIF and only support you with the uh, Direct3D and Voodoo and all that stuff. So. Kind of lame, but yeah, if you can get your hands on the 1.0 version, it will have all the different APIs. So this is running in ATICIF mode, and yeah, runs really good. Fairly playable. Never played through this game before, but if I do, this might be how I'm going to play it. And the last game on our list that supports the ATICIF API is none other than Formula One from 1997. This one does slow down quite a bit more than the other games I've tried, but I would say it's still fairly playable. We checked out Monaco here, so that's the most demanding level anyways, but yeah, the other ones are probably running a little bit better. While everything does work pretty nicely, there's one exception to that, and that is actually this game, Interstate 76. It has a direct 3D mode, and that's what we're going to use. For some reason, the first person mode is really, really laggy. I don't know why. I did try to turn off the rearview mirror. That didn't seem to help much. I tried to change settings. Nothing really seemed to have made it any faster. It just seems really slow, but only in the first person mode. As soon as I switch to third person, it's beautifully smooth. So if anyone knows why this is happening, maybe it's a driver issue. Yeah, it, it looks it looks weird, but there you go. I also noticed that some parts of the car, like the tires seem to be clipping through the car visibly. You can you can see the tires sometimes. That's a bit weird, but uh, I would say the game is still looking like it's playable. Under a sleep gray afternoon sky. The light on your face is soft and dim under the lace curtain and the streets are empty. In the distance, there is a flash and a rumble. Clouds fill the sky like giant wooden ships on a blackened evergreen sea capped with foam. Wow. Hey, Stampede. How about a poem? 
I'm a storm torrent across a slate gray sea. I rush in bellowed reflections of fast, fast, dark sky over an Edinburgh Meadows wet. I know a shortcut. Next up, we have another 1997 game. At least the PC version is from 1997. Star Wars Shadows of the Empire. This one is actually really, really picky when it comes to graphics hardware. And if you're missing any features, it's just going to have weird graphical issues due to that. As we start up the game, it's informing us that we are missing texture blending and fog table. Fog table is really only noticeable from second level onwards. Uh, here on the first level, you don't get any fog, but uh, what you'll see is that the the explosions look, the smoke looks really weird, and the explosions are kind of laggy. Also, I don't know what's up with the videos; they're just really um, they're stretched out and interlaced looking. So not a great showing for the card, but I would say it's still playable. I threw in a little bit of Age of Empires as well, because why not? Haven't played this in decades, so I didn't really play it much just now. I just wanted to see if it works, and it does. That's all I can say about it. This runs on, like, anything. Another Star Wars game. One of my childhood favorites. Star Wars Jedi Knight 2. This one runs much better than... Shadows of the Empire, possibly because it was built up for a, as a PC game instead of being ported over from Nintendo 64. It runs super well. I would have been really happy to be able to play the game like this. However, I remember on my PC back in the day, which was approximately a 1996 era PC with no 3D acceleration, it was rather slow. But uh, maybe eventually I'll make a video on that machine as well. I decided to also check out this game called Ignition. It's also from 97. It has a couple graphical options. It was all maxed out, and I tried 640 by 480 and 320 by 200. 320 by 200 did work a lot better, and that's how I would actually prefer playing the game. You could see some texture pixelation and lack of texture filtering in 640 by 480, which is a little bit jarring, but if you're playing in 320 by 200 you don't really notice that, so that's how I would recommend playing this game. And the framerate is much better that way too. And last but not least, I decided to go around in one of the most fun 1997 games, Theme Hospital. This game doesn't seem too heavy, too demanding, so it ran perfectly fine on our Pentium MX machine with the ATI card. No graphical issues or anything like that, just smooth gameplay. The music didn't really sound like the way I'm used to it sounding, but uh, it was fine.
So that's it for now, I hope you enjoyed watching this video, I certainly enjoyed making it. I wasn't sure how this was going to turn out and how much I was going to enjoy the machine and building the machine, but it, it really surpassed my expectations, I've, it really took me back, it, it, this was a lot of fun. And just playing games on this machine, knowing that the vast majority of the parts are all 1997 era, it's just something magical, it did really feel like, you know. Hey, it really did take me back to the 90s, as cliche as it sounds. It was awesome. And I'm certainly going to... I, I think it was a really good decision to... to transform this PC I had into this other... this 1997 build, because I'm having so much more fun with it than I did with the old machine, and uh, I'm looking forward to playing some more games on it, and... Uh, and experiencing what it's like to have a 1997 build Definitely gonna revisit this machine often, uh, check out some newer games on it as well, see how well it holds up a couple years from now. I've already tried a couple and uh, it's looking pretty good, so uh, look forward to those and it's definitely gonna bring this machine out often I think on streams as well when we're playing some older games because it's bloody awesome. So thank you so much for watching, hope you enjoyed the video and if you did you know what to do, and you can also find my Twitch channel linked in the description where I've basically live streamed all this gameplay and then, like I said, edited it into edited recordings into the video. Catch you in the next video.